So if we talk about the young generation, a question for both uh, of you. Um, should we start teaching in school maybe with a topic like ecological awareness? To start teaching that in school? I mean, of course you could do that, but I think it would be better to, to include that aspect in all other subjects so that we show that everything is connected. I am not a bigot. I am a good global citizen and believe all the socially acceptable things that the good grown-ups at the big banks tell the TV screens to tell me to believe. Welcome to the planet, my dears. Wipe your feet. Come on in. No more need for coats in your mother's den. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Uh, the, the growing human population. Because if where we are, there's nothing else. And do you have views about what should be done about that? Can't you guess? Then the doors burst open. The king and queen walk through. There's our precious daughter. If they did not know what love meant, who would? I am so happy that Prince Philip, friend of Jimmy Savile and father of philanthropist and champion of science Jeffrey Epstein's close friend Prince Andrew, and enlightened scientists like Bill Nye will come up with solutions to the hashtag climate crisis. I believe when the TV tells me that science says the earth is dying because of climate change, which is why I became a vegan activist, but I wish we knew how to stop it so poor Prince Philip and Greta can have their futures back. Growing population is a problem, but notice that the rate that the population is growing, human population is growing, is slowing down. It's, it's apparently raising the standard of living of women and girls, people like you. As women and girls get better educated, they have fewer kids, and the kids they do have have more resources, so they're better taken care of and they are more successful. And I think that was the biggest aha to Bill and me when we got into this work, is we asked ourselves, of course, the same hard-nosed question you'd ask, which is, if you get into this work and you start to save these children, will women just keep overpopulating the world? And thank goodness the converse is absolutely true, because they don't do that. In this year's annual letter, Melinda and I take the toughest questions we get asked and give our answers. One that's come up for a long time is, as we make the world healthier, is the population going to get so big that feeding everybody and maintaining the environment is going to be impossible? We find that in every country of the world, this is repeated. The population growth goes down as we improve health. That the faster we improve health, the faster family size goes down. And so we can feel great about saving those lives Having a child means that your net carbon output per year in tons is 59. From one child is 59. Going on a vegan diet removes 0.8. So if you have a child, that's literally making up for like 70 vegans. That's, that's exactly you know, if, if you go car free, if I lived in Manha if I live in Manhattan and I don't drive, I am the equivalent of three vegans. If I wash my clothes with cold water, if I hang them to dry and I recycle everything, that's the equivalent of one vegan diet. I am so glad my educated wife knew better than to have children. It gives me more time to become a better version of myself. If we did have kids she wouldn't have this great job and I couldn't have gotten the vasectomy from Dr. Gregor that her corporate health insurance paid for. My wife's boyfriend suggested I take a break from playing my Nintendo Switch and doing hardcore vegan activism in YouTube comments a few times a week to meditate or exercise but even my spiritual leader, Sadhguru, is concerned about the hashtag climate crisis. Maybe he has a viable solution to this real and not made up crisis that is going to make everything bad happen if we don't do what the good grown-ups in government, banks, and the media tell us to do. Unless you reduce the human footprint on the planet, there is no solution for anything. Then they ask me a brilliant question, how do you reduce the human footprint? I said, you have to reduce the number of feet. That's the only way. <laughs> So, 
right now. It doesn't matter what others think, all of you who are here and those of you who are hanging out with me, we can take it upon ourselves that we will not push the human population. You can have a dog. He promoted this on television and, and he went around <laughs> all the agricultural shows and he had a... Tr I mean, he was a one-man thing and it had a tremendous effect and reduced it from three percent to one percent. But one of the things he said to the farmers, he said, look, you don't need all these children, it's ridiculous. You, you've got to feed them all, clothe them all, educate them all and, and look after their health. It's, so have a few and then if you want to go on entertaining yourself, have a vasectomy. Oh, yes. Well, how do I do that? Well, I'll organize it for you. <laughs> we'll, 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 it, it, we'll, we'll have buses running into Bangkok on the king's birthday, very auspicious day. <laughs> and you will go into, and he took over a whole lot of school halls and that sort of thing. And, he, and he, had, he showed me a photograph of all these beds and everything. And people went in and they, and I said, but how did they take it? Well, he said, they didn't like being seen to have the operation. Oh, I said, really, how do you do that? I had visions of, you know, putting up. Oh, he said, it's quite simple, I blindfolded them. Global How citizens you? breaking news. I am not a bigot. I am a good global citizen who takes the recommended daily dosage of vitamin TV to keep me in a state of anxiety, agitation, confusion and learned helplessness. I am not a science denier. I trust the experts. I do not deny science. The good grown-up experts from science on the TV interrupt this totally real and not made up hashtag climate crisis to bring you information from a more important and totally real death threat from a global pandemic virus. We must all listen to the experts from science and obey the TV and participate in this totally necessary and justified mandatory panic. Uh, spoiler alert, you're a scientist. What I will say of this virus, I think we're in the middle of a massive experiment worldwide and that and where is where the guinea pigs uh, uh maybe the experiment is will people listen to scientists <laughs> in, in this case referring to medical professionals medical in professionals, this particular say, case say anthony fauci over uh, allergy and infectious disease for example yeah. and um are you washing your hands and are you taking these precautions these are warnings offered by scientists. And for our own good. For our own good. And I'd be interesting if we all paid attention to what scientists say, obeying the recommendations of scientists. It's an interesting experiment we're in the middle of. Report by Johns Hopkins researchers and said that as many as 6,000 children a day could die over a six month period from preventable causes because of healthcare system disruptions caused by the coronavirus. Our next guest, uh, Greta Thunberg, recently gave $100,000 she had received for her climate change activism to UNICEF to help protect kids from the pandemic. She's also helping raise even more money for UNICEF. She recently revealed she believes she may have had coronavirus after returning home from working in Europe. She said her symptoms were very mild and her father, who had traveled with her, also got sick. We spoke to uh, Greta Thunberg earlier this afternoon. During this crisis, during any crisis, it is always the the most vulnerable people who are hit the hardest, and that is children. Um. Because there's so much focus on coronavirus, there's a lot of kids around the world who may die of things that are very treatable, but because medical systems are overwhelmed, it's gonna impact children uh, in ways that a lot of people don't really anticipate. Coronavirus! I have to say as well, I mean, Anderson and I have traveled around the world and seen the, the amazing work UNICEF has done in various places. I mean, it's a, really is a, a terrific organization, Children's Emergency Fund. I am so, so scared. If the extra non-essential people don't all obey science and stop working, wear masks, obey social distancing guidelines from science, and stay home until the good grown-ups tell us it's safe again, everything bad will happen always and all the people will die. The models clearly show that this is necessary and we have no choice but to listen to the experts from science. I am not selfish. 
I am a good global citizen who does not hate children and grandma. I will listen to what this brave, grassroots 16 year old human shield tells me to do. I am not a bigot. The science is settled. We must accept a new normal. My wife's boyfriend is an essential worker on the front lines. He is a university graduate and a department manager at Walmart and understands the science and the models. He assures me that this is the right thing for us non-essential people to do. I've seen you talk about online too is just how important it is to listen to experts and listen to science. And this is a time when, you know, I was not a very good science student. Um, when I was in school, um, but this is a time it seems that you know the global scientific community is so critically important, and we're really seeing just how important it is to to follow science. Yes, yes, exactly, and and I hope that we can see now the the scientific community are stepping up and they are they are speaking up more than they have they done before because. Obviously, this is a crisis that would require the scientific community to speak up, and um, and I hope that people really. It it feels like uh, science is getting uh, the role of science is is changing now. It's becoming more. People are starting to realize that we are actually depending on science and that we need to listen to scientists and experts. And I I really hope that we that that stays and that that also. Um, is is for for other crises such as the climate crisis and the environmental crisis that we actually understand that we have to listen to to the scientists. If the world was vegan, there would be no COVID-19. Up until 10,000 years ago, there were no epidemic diseases. What changed? We domesticated animals. How's it going? I hope you're being safe out there and in good health. And certainly, I hope you're having enough toilet paper at home. Corona emerged due to the consumption of meat. What can I do in the future to prevent this? Leave the meat off your plate. Don't buy any animal products and don't consume anything that an animal died for or has been raped for or has been tortured for. You know what I'm saying? So in order to avoid a pandemic in the future, you might want to look into your current diet and, and see what consequences to have an animal on your plate might have on a global scale. And you're seeing it right now. You know, this is a small taste. American philosopher John Rawls devised a thought experiment called the Veil of Ignorance. He suggested that when trying to determine a moral course of action on an issue that affects multiple people, we should make that decision from a veil of ignorance in regarding which person we will be. For instance, when designing a social policy that affects two different classes of people, one can imagine that once this policy has been designed, one will be placed somewhere in this society with an equal chance of ending up in either of the two classes. The idea is that placing oneself in a veil of ignorance when designing societies or social policies for that matter should result in a more fair and just society where everyone's interests are considered equally. The British government has now put restrictions in place to slow the spread of this virus. People in the UK are only allowed to leave their homes for specific reasons. This includes shopping for necessities, medical care, and traveling to and from work if it's absolutely necessary. Shops selling non-essential goods have been closed, as well as gyms, libraries, places of worship, and gatherings of more than two people have been banned. It's extremely important that these measures are enforced and that we practice social distancing, because potentially every one person can set in motion a chain of events that results in thousands of people being infected. Despite this, it seems that many people in the UK aren't taking this seriously with photos emerging of packed tube stations and crowded parks. The mortality rates can be expected to increase over time if no countermeasures are put in place to flatten the curve, with hospitals becoming overrun with cases. Sure, if you ignore these guidelines, you may not ever see the victims of your actions, but I can't see how that's morally relevant. If I buy cow's cheese, directly affecting the supply and demand and causing more cows to be tortured and killed, I'll never see my victim but I'm still morally responsible for their suffering and death. This is especially the case when we consider that the government have now told us extensively 
the risks of leaving home and not practicing good hygiene. We have now been told countless times that more people will die if we do not take this seriously. One argument is that going outside is going to give you a large amount of pleasure and that you'll be missing out on something if you don't go outside. Perhaps as a social event you really want to go ahead or you're just bored of social distancing. This is essentially the same argument that non-vegans use when trying to justify killing animals. If we don't think that we can justify killing non-humans on the basis of pleasure, then surely we can't justify killing humans on the basis of pleasure. I mean, come on, what next? Perhaps you also think that because lions don't self-isolate, humans shouldn't either. I think we all know that the behaviour of lions isn't an excuse for humans killing animals or humans. You may also think that Hitler self-isolated and he was a vegetarian. And while it's true that Hitler did self-isolate before his death, what Hitler did and didn't do is irrelevant to what we should do. To be fair though, if God wanted us to self-isolate, why would he give us legs? Another argument people may use is that the quicker we all get infected, the quicker we reach herd immunity. This of course is true if a virus can only infect you once, which we are not certain of when it comes to coronavirus. Wow, that is some of the most powerful science I've ever heard. I feel so helpless and afraid, but comforted that the science has a plan to fight this terrible real death threat from this pandemic. The essential workers at the hospitals need our help. We must stay home and implement a global lockdown until the good grown-up experts like philanthropist Jeffrey Epstein's close friend Bill Gates come up with a happy, safe, healthy injectable science medicine to make us immune and healthy. Luckily, this won't affect my vegan activism which is done anonymously in social media comments. I just wish all the non-essential people would listen to us empowered science affirming activists and stay home and eat plant based kibble so we can win the battle against the invisible enemy. Toxic masculinity and science denial seem to be at the root of this problem. It seems like both the hashtag climate crisis and this pandemic can be remedied with the same medicine. A global totalitarian technocratic social control grid of government enforced mandatory poverty, and a new normal that redefines old, outdated concepts like freedom, healthy diet, family, and masculinity. What do these four countries have in common? It's two things. Taiwan, New Zealand, Germany, Norway. All four of them reacted decisively to the coronavirus crisis, all four of them kept infection rates and death rates low, and all four of them have female leaders. This coronavirus crisis has shown clearly that we need competent, empathetic leadership, and that means more women in positions of power, and less of the macho stupidity and sociopathic behavior that we get from Bolsonaro in Brazil, Boris Johnson in the UK, or Trump here in the United States. These toxic masculinity exuding non-essential extra people who refuse to wear their healthy muscles, stay home and accept mandatory unemployment are infringing on my rights. These science denier irresponsible non-essential people are the same bigots who wouldn't listen to the good grown-up philanthropists who tried to help them sterilize themselves and give up their non-essential rights to travel, eat meat, have jobs, own land, and reproduce in order to save our poor sick mommy earth from all the toxic CO2 exhalations that the experts say the nasty extra people are off gassing. The, the, the act of killing the animal wasn't the masculine trait back then. It was the act of providing for, for, the, for your homes, right, was the masculine trait back in the day. Gender, gender roles change, right, but this is back in the day, right? The, act, the masculine act was to provide and to, to look after and to defend. But we've conflated that with the masculine thing being aggressive but also killing animals and so you, you translate that feeling to a 2019 context and you have people thinking actually well actually to be manly means to eat meat but actually to be manly doesn't mean to eat meat it means to, to look after right and my favorite be, vegan uh, activist can help re-educate these ignorant science denial just lockdown just foes like they just need some inspirational speeches from positive male role models to teach them to accept the new normal. Earthling Ed can help them understand why masculinity is not about eating meat, or having unnecessary things like children, jobs, guns, testosterone, real animal foods, and rights. 
If only more men would be like Earthling Ed we would not have viruses because people would not eat animals, or toxic masculinity because men would be comfortable with their lack of masculinity and redefinition of it. Getting women to find you attractive and it's, it's really grotesque when you watch these adverts and you simplify what's happening in these adverts and what's being reinforced to people, but it really, really works. Like advertising is so powerful. So now you have this idea of that and then as a vegan, I get accused of being a soy boy, right? And now I am a soy boy because I love soy. Like, that's fine. I drink soy milk, I eat tofu. But the idea is by being a soy boy, you're what, feminizing yourself, right? Because there's phytoestrogens and soy products, which there is. This brave, stunning activist has me literally shaking with self-empowered, redefined masculinity and an unstoppable drive to stay home and stop this virus and the hashtag climate crisis by continuing my hero's journey of vegan activism in YouTube comments and on my anonymous Instagram profile. Real masculinity is not about having or providing for a family and children, producing and eating real animal foods, or having unnecessary testosterone and muscle and rights. Real masculinity is about using female emotional manipulation techniques to make people behave like you want them to. Thank you, Earthling Ed. I stand with you and you're not toxically masculine man bun and proudly declare. I am a soy boy because I love soy. Like that's fine, I drink soy milk, I hate tofu. But the idea is by being a soy boy, you're what, feminizing yourself, right? Because there's phytoestrogens in soy products, which there is. Like, um, you know, this idea that we have to reinforce these tropes of what it means to be a man. And so almost eating meat is a stamp of that dominance and authority and is a reminder of, 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 of kind of like more archaic and transgressive masculine traits and roles, which is interesting.